CityCast Boise is brought to you by WestVet. At WestVet, they know pets aren't like family, they are family. That's why they provide expert, compassionate veterinary care 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for cats and dogs. WestVet Boise and WestVet Meridian offer the region's most comprehensive emergency and specialty care from board-certified veterinarians and an expert caregiver team. WestVet can also help your pet with unexpected, non-critical conditions with their urgent care program. Visit westvet.net to find care you can count on from the team that is leading specialty health care for pets. Today on CityCast Boise, snow has finally come to Bogus Basin. Austin Smith is the director of marketing for the ski area and is here with an epic snow report. Plus, we learn how snow sorcerers are battling climate change on the slopes. It's Thursday, January 11th. I'm Frankie Barnhill, and this is what Boise's talking about. Austin, thanks so much for being on CityCast Boise. Thank you for having me. So, yeah, of course, the big news this week that we we need to talk about is snow has finally arrived on Bogus Basin. Uh, actual snow falling from the sky. Can't believe it. How badly did you need this storm? We were very much looking forward to our first substantial snowfall of the season. Would say that we were happy to receive it, but we were pulling off quite a feat with just our snowmaking until the snow arrived. And now we've got a nice, helpful push to really get the mountain shining. Yeah, we definitely want to talk about your snowmaking later on. But uh, sticking with the, the storm from this week, yeah, you basically went from like no no snow from, from Mother Nature to a whole bunch. People must be pretty excited. Absolutely. They uh, showed up in droves after the holiday weekend or at the tail end of a holiday weekend, very eager, tons of first day uses of their season passes. And it was really felt like a good major kickoff for the start of the season. For folks who want to hit the slopes for the first time this coming weekend to take advantage of the fresh snow, what what should they be aware of? Definitely travel prepared. The road will likely be in winter condition. We highly recommend four wheel drive, all wheel drive with snow tires. Always a good idea to carry chains in case you find yourself in a tricky situation or not having great traction on the road. Our roads are plowed and sanded round the clock during periods of snowfall, but that does not mean that they are immune to being a high elevation alpine road. We definitely recommend that you carpool, help take some cars off the road, get more people to the mountain, help traffic get there in an effective manner. Um, We definitely recommend being safe, taking your time, being courteous and respectful to those on the road. And above all else, plan ahead, leave early. There's a lot of eager people looking to get in the snowfall, and it's always best on a weekend with snowfall to be the mountain about an hour ahead of time of the mountain opening. Do you expect now with with even more snow that there might be more people buying passes or are those closed? How, How does that work? We have a variety of season pass products that are good for the duration of the season. They come in different variations with different levels of access. Our anytime pass, effectively what you would consider a pass that gets you access to, you know, open to close on the weekends. It's obviously our most in-demand pass is the one that has no restrictions on it. And so those passes reach their capacity limits in early October, I think for the fourth year in a row. And so those are products that we sell the majority of in February during our acclaimed end of February season pass sale sell about 80 plus percent of those passes then. And then they kind of trickle out through the summer and typically reach their capacity in early, mid-October. And is that what you saw this year? The capacity was reached at the normal time? Yeah, absolutely. And then shortly after the capacity was reached on anytime passes, we reached it on our Twilight Pass, which is another fan favorite product giving access seven days a week from three to close. And that left our midweek pass, so Monday Friday, Monday through Friday access, and our night pass, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. access available. Those passes can still be purchased. We also do day tickets for day of skiing. We prefer people purchase those in advance, and we monitor the quantities of those tickets in anticipation for pass holder arrivals based on what the weather is. So if we're seeing snow in the forecast, those tickets are very, very scarce and much harder to come by day of, but they are available as early as uh, the Wednesday at 4 p.m. for the coming weekend and following weekdays. So a Saturday through Friday schedule. 
let's step back from this big storm from this week. Climate change is happening in Idaho. Uh, you don't need to look beyond Bogus Basin to see that. Before this week's storm, the mountain was really relying on snowmaking and snow machines, as I understand it, to to open and then to stay open. Did you start making snow, did I read, on November 1st? Is that correct? Yeah. After a couple rounds of some test snowmaking, where we ensure the system's functioning properly, we began our snowmaking process in early November, and it's a game of inches, pun intended. You have <laughs> to... You have to make snow every opportunity you get from a weather perspective because no weather is guaranteed. And the snow that you do make in snowmaking is much more durable and resilient to temperatures, rain, any sort of adverse weather uh, than our natural snow due to its water content. So typically what you do is you you have your gun set out and you blow snow as soon as you can. And it makes kind of these small piles. And over time, they build into what we call a whale. And mm. those piles are self-insulating. So you you build your whales or you blow snow and form whales, these giant crusted over snow piles. And then when you think the time is right, you break through them spreading the snow out, which is also a risk because you now have more surface area that attracts light, less insulate, insulation from the snow itself, protecting the snow within. Yeah, it sounds like a science and an art at the same time, the way you're describing it. November 1st seems really early. Or have there been other early years where snowmaking was essential to get the mountain up and rolling? November 1st feels early, but as it panned out, um, and if there's anyone listening to this that makes snow, totally understands this season, the temperature windows where we had snowmaking conditions were very far and few between early on. And so those early days were absolutely mission critical for us to be able to open and get the mountain up and running as early as November 19th. Wow. Is it right? Am, am I right in saying that your snowmaking system, the current one, really came about in 2019? We installed it the summer of 2018. And then while we were able to use it the 18-19 winter, we didn't have the whole spring summer worth of water refill from the snow melt. So we started the season with a relatively low pond. We did use the system, but it was not at its full capacity until the fall of 2019 or the 1920 season when we started at November 1st with a full pond. Okay, gotcha. So is this kind of, was this year up to this point kind of the first real, real, real test uh, since this, the current system came online of can we get this mountain going without anything, any help from Mother Nature? Yeah, I would say that the years in between now and when the system was online, we always had some amount of help from Mother Nature. We were absolutely making snow and snowmaking was definitely bringing skiing and snowboarding to the people of the Treasure Valley. But it was somewhat disguised with a, uh, a nice layer of Mother Nature's help. This season, we would not have been operating not only as early as we were, but it, it would have been pretty thready um, coming up on the holidays had we not had snowmaking. And it was Definitely the season where we put our system to the test and saw record-breaking flow rates of uh, gallons of water per minute while we were blowing snow. It was, it was, there was a lot of really large successes this season. Yeah, I was reading on your website that this year, for the first time in your 81 years, you opened 100% on mountain-made snow. Yep. And we actually have more runs with snowmaking than we have water in the pond. And we were able to get all but one of those runs open pretty rapidly on our system by being smart with where we blew snow, how we use the water during what periods and temperatures we did and focusing on certain runs kind of in a cascading one after the another process. Um, and so I think from that standpoint, getting through all of the runs that we could have with snowmaking while still having to operate on snowmaking is what marked that first year in our 81 years that it was 100% snowmaking. Your snowmaking system is the second largest in Idaho, only second to Sun Valley, as I understand it. So how many how many snowmaking guns do you have? And I hear there might be a special name, special term for the people who run the guns. This season really leaned into trying to brand some of the back 
backbone of the mountain that no one sees. Everyone goes home and dreams of being able to carve turns on groomers and bottomless pow days. And that's all made possible by a mountain operations team that mostly operates in the dark. And so under the brand of the snow sorcerers or those that perform <laughs> the magic while everyone sleeps. Um, and, and, and while we focused on the snowmakers this year, it does include our grooming team that moves that snow around and our parks team that design features for the public to enjoy. All of that happens while everyone sleeps. And so the snow sorcerers, and in this case, the snowmakers of the snowmakers of that brand, they put down some serious time, lots of hours, long hours. If they've got temperatures, they got to be there. They got to be working. And so far, we've, we've put over 20 million gallons of water converted to snow. And uh, it's kind of a hard thing for people to understand how a gallon turns to snow. But the metric I like to use is the space that a football field occupies is a little bit more than it's like 1.3 acres. Hmm. The equivalent water that we've used would be enough to cover a football field over 50 feet high in snow. Wow. Okay. That's a, wow. That's a really interesting visual. Yes. Um, it's an immense amount. Yeah, it really is. Um, the snow snor- sorcerers. I just hope they have like a cool hat and like maybe a maybe a sword or something that goes with it. <laughs> merch, mer- merch coming soon. Merch um, coming soon. Um, maybe maybe next season we'll have we'll have bogus basin snow sorcerer merch. I'm already kind of envisioning a logo for it. It's got a crystal ball, <laughs> big piles of snow. Yeah, it's gonna be great. <laughs> Divining the future of the snowfall. Yeah. You're a scrappy nonprofit. I think some people might not be aware that Bogus Basin is a nonprofit ski mm-hmm. mountain, which is very different from, you know, some of the the big for-profit ski resorts in the West. Um, and I point this out just because of resources. I just am curious, you know, thinking about uh, last year was a pretty good year for, for natural snow. This year, obviously, up until this point, wasn't so good. So, you know, just thinking about the future and the unpredictability that comes with climate change, um, how are you feeling about the resources that you have now? Does it feel like it's enough for a future that could be much less consistent um, with with natural snowfall? Yeah, I, I think this is actually a really good question. And it's something that, you know, the scrappiness of it is probably the beauty. But one of the things that have come out of being a nonprofit is actually a financial sustainability. And so when we do really well, and as we did last year, we hold on to that money because the only thing we can do with that money is invest it into the mountain. And so as we've done all of this work to the mountain, and at this point it's pushing close to $60 million, that's all cash investment. None of that is debt. And so we owe no one anything. Like we It's us, we did it ourselves. And when I say we, it's not we Bogus Basin, it's we the community. We banded together, we chose to ski, we invested in Bogus Basin, and in turn Bogus Basin continues to invest in the community. And so with climate challenges ahead of us, it's no secret that we're gonna need to keep investing in snowmaking. We're looking at expansions of the pond to retain more water, more runs to offer more variety. And it's another reason that the mountain has has diversified its portfolio from winter recreation to summer recreation. We've got a bustling bike park. We've got music events for the community. We're finding ways to activate with the Treasure Valley 365 days a year. Yeah, I I pointed out that it's you guys are a nonprofit because also because it's fairly rare, right? It's fairly rare in the the world of ski mountains for nonprofits. Or am I wrong? Is that there are more and more ski hills turning to nonprofit models? No, it's it's actually very rare. There's 460 areas in the United States, give or take. And very few of them are nonprofit. And of those that are nonprofit, very few of them are of the size of Bogus Basin. I think something people discount with having Bogus Basin so close to them and so available is truly how large of an operation it is. Bogus Basin is like a top 30 mountain in the United States. We're the largest or most visited mountain in the state of Idaho. It's not just your local small hill. We're a full size mountain experience. And from that standpoint, and and the nonprofit aspect of the mountain, it's absolutely an anomaly and is very rare in this industry. 
Talk to me a little bit about uh, the the community aspect in terms of, you know, getting as many people on the mountain who are interested in it as possible, um, making it an affordable uh, possibility, making options available to folks who would otherwise feel disenfranchised or like, oh, that's not for me. What what ca- what can you tell us about like programs that might be available or if someone's interested who's never skied, what should they know or snowboarded for that matter? Yeah, we, we have a a pretty large portfolio of programs, notably in the engaging with the youth and getting new users into the sport. We have several programs that are tied back to schools that bring schools up um, at highly discounted rates. And then we also have internal, you know, paid for programs that are well below market rate to convert new users to the sport. The nationally awarded program that most mountains have adopted is kind of the so many lessons and then you get your season pass for the rest of the season and you get equipment and the hope being that you take X amount of lessons, you fall in love with the sport, we give you the things you need. And then the next season you choose to be a season pass holder and continue with it. And that program is called the Passport Program. Our night ticket's a super affordable way to come up and visit the mountain. Our beginner, we call it our beginner ticket, but it's our bunny hill chairlift and the magic carpets is $15 anytime. So there's a lot of ways to try the sport out. Um, For most people, they find that getting to the mountain, being in the cold, there's a lot of factors beyond cost. And we're we're doing everything we can to try to lower those barriers. And it, it definitely helps being as close to a metropolitan area as we are. Well, our producer, Evelyn Avitia, has uh, made a New Year's resolution that she will give it a shot for the first time. So, Evelyn, I know you're listening. Uh, Here's some tips. What else should people know, Austin? Anything else you want to add? This has been great. You know, I I hope everyone gets to hear from someone from the mountain how grateful we are for this community. Really, Bogus Basin would not exist if it wasn't for the Treasure Valley and the Treasure Valley's belief in Bogus Basin to get the job done, keep uplifting people via chairlifts and experiences, and, and really showing the world how important mountain recreation and getting outside all four seasons is it's uh, a very fortunate position that we are in to get to serve a community like the treasure valley and not really be caught up in the weeds of attracting destination business and lodging like we are focused on one thing and one thing only and that's the experience you have while you're on the mountain and to feel that love from the treasure valley is a very unique position to be in in the industry there's a lot of areas that struggle with their perception in their local community. And I, you know, at least from my side of the coin and from the bogus side, it it is a blessing to get to work for the Treasure Valley. Yeah, it's it seems like it's a a beloved institution in, in the Treasure Valley, to say the least. So thanks, Austin. Thank you. Thanks for listening to CityCast Boise. For tips on how to stay safe and enjoy the snowstorm, be sure to subscribe to our Hey Boise newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with our Friday news chat. See you then.